Okay, we want to uh, welcome everyone uh, to this afternoon's program uh, of our Bedford Playhouse, quote unquote, virtual playhouse. Uh, my name is Dan. <clears throat> I'm the Director of Development and Programming, and I'm very, very pleased to be able to introduce uh, and present Julie Morgenstern for this uh, afternoon's talk. Uh, I should say, as we do uh, for all of these things, um, for those of you who are new to Zoom uh, and are not familiar with its use, uh, if you are on a uh, laptop, um, you can find at the bottom, uh, there is a Q&A button, uh, which uh, will allow you to ask questions, post questions at any time. Julie will be taking questions towards the end, uh, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. If you're on your iPad or a mobile device, I believe that it is towards the top of your screen, uh, and you can also uh, you can find it there. Uh, Bedford Playhouse right now, uh, obviously, given the circumstances, is currently closed. Um, we do ask that at the end of today's program, if you enjoyed it and you'd like to see more like it, that you consider uh, making a donation to help us through while we're operating in the virtual world. You can go to our website, which is bedfordplayhouse.org, click on ways to give, um, and there's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Every amount is appreciated. Uh, we know that um, everybody's having a tough time right now. So uh, anything that you can do, it's completely tax deductible, uh, or you can consider maybe perhaps becoming a member. Uh, there are membership benefits such as discounts on tickets uh, and other uh, benefits, concessions, special members only invitations. Uh, we are offering this Friday, once again, a curbside concession program, which has member discounts eligible. Uh, you can go on and pre-order um, popcorn, candy, uh, to get you through your weekend viewing at home. Uh, so, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Julie, and forgive me if I actually have to read her bio, because it's kind of impressive, and there's no way I would ever be able to memorize it uh, in time. Uh, Julie Morgenstern is an organizing and productivity consultant, New York Times bestselling author and speaker. For over 30 years, she's been teaching people all around the world and at all stages of life how to overcome disorganization to achieve their goals. Uh, her mission is to free each individual to make their unique contribution to the world by helping them design their own systems for managing time and space that feel natural and are easy to maintain. And this inside out approach to organizing everything gives her readers, listeners, and clients the energy and knowledge they need to get and stay organized. Uh, she has shared her experience on countless TV and radio outlets, Oprah Winfrey, CNN, The Rachel Ray Show, The Today Show, Good Morning America, National Public Radio, uh, she's quoted and featured regularly in a wide variety of publications, um, has been in the New York Times, Time Magazine, uh, Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. Uh, and we're very, very, very happy to have her with us. So I'm going to now invite Julie to turn on her camera and microphone and turn things over to her. Okay. Hi, Dan. Julie. And honored Bye, guests. Julie. See you in a little while. Hello. All right. Thank you, everybody. I'm so delighted that you've chosen to join this afternoon, and I'm very excited to share some insights and strategies uh, that I think will help you in this very uh, challenging time. So let's see. I'm going to share my screen, and let's get going. Let's make sure that's up, and we're going to go play. How's that? OK. All right, the Great Juggling Act. So look, the juggling act for parents has never been easy. Never. It's never been easy. It's like the biggest job in the world. And it's the one job that comes without a job manual. When my daughter was born, I was shocked that there weren't time management brochures that were handed out in maternity wards with every baby that's born. And there's not time management brochures in the waiting room of pediatricians offices or sent home with schools, right? Like it's such a difficult job. Um, and we, we have no sort of way to organize ourselves. It's not handed to us. And now in the time of Corona, in the time of sudden lockdown or stay at home orders, the job has gotten infinitely more complex. Um, and parents who are juggling this, I think it's in terms of who is stuck at home, I think people, parents who are stuck at home, I think everybody would agree, have the greatest challenge of all. 
And at this point, whether we're eight weeks or 10 weeks into this process, you may have come up with settled into some kind of routines or some kind of systems, but the whole thing was sort of set up, uh, is sort of thrust upon us. And even if you found a little bit of a rhythm, I'm sure you thought this was temporary. And what's happened is kind of the end of this, the road just got stretched out before us to some unknown amount of time. Are kids gonna like, are there gonna be summer programs that we can send our kids to? What's gonna happen in the fall? Are they gonna go back to school? Are they gonna go back to school one, you know, in groups of like A and B, one week on, one week off? How do you organize for that? And I think we have to be prepared. Honestly, my prediction, my thought is we have to all now prepare for a long-term hybrid situation, hybrid life that we have to be able to set our homes up to work from home if we work and also work from an office and to seamlessly flow between those. We have to be able to set up to school from home and school at school and be able to flow back and forth seamlessly. I think that's what we all have to prepare for, for at least the next year. And maybe it's a permanent change, right? We don't know, but that I think is the key and not think that this is a thing that's gonna end as soon as they you know, take us off pause and turn everything back on. I don't think it's gonna go that way. So I would like to get a feel, and I hope I can sort of see all this for um, who's in the room. And, and the first question that I have is if you could raise your hand, if you have kids who are five and under, raise your hand. And um, I, Dan, I would love for you to share what you see because I don't have access to the hand raising, I don't think. No problem, Julius. Looks like we have um, so far eight, eight people have raised their hand. Okay. Eight have raised their hand for kids that are five or under. What about five to 10? So everybody take your hand down and now re-raise your hand if, or raise your hand anew if you have kids between five and 10. I'd like to get a feel for that. Um, how's that? Because, and I'll just sort of fill this time. The challenges are a little different if you have kids that are preschool versus kids who are school age versus kids. We're gonna talk about tweens and teens. So I, your count I actually, there, Julie, is, uh, sorry to interrupt you, your count there is seven people. Okay, now take your hand down. Last question is, who in the audience has kids who are tweens and teens? Let's get a feel for that. Um, good. All right, I see it's sort mm -hmm. of the largest group so far. I did yep, find it. Looks it like, uh, looks like nine people. Okay, good. All right, good. So we have people, and I would bet that there are people who have kids in multiple age ranges, right? You might have a preschooler plus a school ager plus a teenager uh, all over the place. All right, so, so what I'm gonna do today and then this little time we have together is I'm gonna give you some really practical strategies and tools that you can use in this environment and beyond to lighten your workload, lighten the burden, um, to give you more confidence and more sense of control and something that you actually can carry from this point forward to better manage your time and your energy as you are dealing with this giant juggling act, okay? And that's really till your kids go off to college. That's how long this model will last, but we're starting where we are. So the first thing is the control panel. What is the job description of a parent? This was the thing that's been so hard to find. And when I worked on Time to Parent, one of the things that occurred to me, and it was after my, my, my daughter was out of the nest, I couldn't figure it out while I was there, you're just in the day to day. But one thing nobody talks about is that the years we are raising our kids happen to be the prime of our own adult development years exactly parallel to when you're raising your kids, you're establishing and fueling a career, a professional life, that's peak time, peak earning capacity. You're establishing adult relationships with you know, your significant other and a circle of friends, and you're discovering who you are as a human. That's at the same time, no one ever talks about that. But it's important to recognize that as we figure out what do we need to balance our time between 
while raising kids. And as a time management expert for many decades, several decades, I don't want to over exaggerate. I don't look that old. Um, one thing I learned is that job ambiguity in any role, in any position, in any industry is a surefire recipe for overwork, inefficiency, and insecurity. If we don't know what we're supposed to balance our time between, how do we know where we're strong and where we're weak? How do we know when our day is done? How do we wrap our day in a bow and say we've done our job and now we can take time for ourselves? It's impossible. So job clarity is number one. What is that job description? I'm gonna propose a framework. This is an organizer's framework based on several decades of coaching parents and families around the world. What do you need? Here's a simple way to think about the balancing act. No matter pre-corona, during corona, after corona, this is a parent's juggling act. First, divide the job into two parts, raising a human and being a human. And then each of those have four components. So to raise a happy, healthy human, we as parents, caretakers, grandparents, the caretakers in that kid's life, we have to juggle our time between four activities. We have to provide for our kids, right? That's like working and making and managing money to pay for everything that our kids need to have a good life. We also have to spend time arranging the logistics of our kids' lives. Where are they going to school? Oh, right now it's in our living room, but where do they go to school? What are they eating for lunch and dinner? What are we doing for the summer? Uh, you know, who's cleaning the house? How do we get all of the logistics of the household working? The scheduling, it's a huge job. Underestimated by most people and how time consuming and complex that is. We also need to spend time relating to our kids. That's connecting to our kids one-on-one. -on -one. It's what a lot of people call the quality time. I'm really entering your child's world and getting to know each kid for the unique individual they are. And then we have to spend time teaching our kids, right? Under normal circumstances, we have to teach our kids values and life skills so they can be successful in the world. In Corona time, we actually, the, our job there, we are serious like uh, extensions to the school, making sure while they're at home that we, they are being taught, that we're monitoring their learning, uh, that we're coordinating all that. We're like sort of teacher's assistants. So provide a rage, relate, teach. That's four activities to raise a happy, healthy human. And that spells an acronym, PART, as in doing your part for another person. Okay. Now we as adults are responsible for our kids' well-being, but we are also responsible for our own. So to be a happy, healthy human, we also need to divide our time between four things. We have to spend time on sleep, which is, you know, always under assault when you're a parent from the birth of your first till the, you know, launch of your last. But if we don't sleep, we are not, we don't have the energy, we don't have the brain power, we don't have the patience, we don't have the wherewithal to do our part, right? Total sleep deprivation compromises everything on the left side of this screen, right? So sleep is critical in to, to, to even doing your part. We also need to spend time on exercise, right? Which is formal or informal movement and fitness that makes us have energy and confidence to be able to do our part and feel good in the world. We have to spend time on lo adult love relationships with our marriages, our significant others, our circle of friends, our extended family, because it's very hard to nurture others when we are not nurtured ourselves, right? And we have to spend time on fun. And fun, what I mean by fun in this case is it's on the hobbies or the passions or the activities of pure relaxation that whenever you do them, you feel like you. 
So we're going to go in deeper in a minute on each of these, but first let's just look at, does anybody see the acronym in that? There's also an acronym right here. It's sleep, exercise, love, fun is self fueling yourself. This is the job. These are the edges. It is not 8,000 things that we have to juggle as parents. It's not infinite things. It's not two, it's eight, four for your kids and four for yourself. So now here's where it gets really interesting. Let's start drilling down on each side of this. So when it comes to doing your part, as adults, as parents, we think time spent on any one of these four counts as all time in. No matter what your mix of time is between these four, it's all the same to us. That's our parenting time versus our self time. But kids experience each type of time very differently. Why? And you know, I, and you may relate to this yourself or just how often have you heard parents who say, I sacrificed my entire life for my kids. And those kids say, my parents were never there for me. How often does that happen? A lot, right? So why is that? How is that possible? How can both things be true? They can be true because some of these four activities are visible to our kids and some are invisible. Some of these activities take place in the adult world and some take place in the child's world. So now look at this matrix. And you think about the job of a parent. The time spent providing, working, making, managing money takes a massive amount of time, but it takes place in the adult world and under normal circumstances, that time is invisible to our kids. All they know is we're not there, right? We're off providing, creating great life, but they don't see that time. A range also takes a massive amount of time. And that takes place in the child's world because either they have something to eat for dinner or don't, the laundry is done or not, the school supplies have been ordered or not. So they feel if we don't do the arranging, but the time we spend doing it on, is largely invisible to our kids. We do it while they're busy doing something else. They're at school, they're busy here, we do it at night, we fill in the cracks and they don't see what it takes under normal circumstances. They're seeing it a little bit or a lot more now. Relate and teach are the two activities that it takes to raise a kid, a happy, healthy kid that are visible to kids because we, they see us. Those are the interactions when we're relating to our kids and when we're teaching our kids, we are right in front of them. And that time is together. But even those two are different. And when you look at this matrix, it's extremely illuminating to think of it this way, because we often merge those in our heads. Like teaching is love, right? And guiding is love. And it is love and it can be loving, but they're different. How so? When we are teaching our kids, we are bringing our kids into the adult world and they are the students of us. When you relate to a child, the job is to enter the child's world and be a student of the child, to get to know the world through their eyes, what's in their heart, what's in their minds, what interests them. And to be on the receiving end of each of those feels very different. If you enter the child's world or you're, and you're the student or they're coming into the adult world and they're the student. And every expert that I spoke to, and I did eight years of research into the science of human development for this book, every expert, pediatrician, sociologist, child expert um, said, in order to create the conditions for teach, we always should start with relate. Relate before teach. And if we start with teach, it's very hard for kids to even listen. And that's where a lot of the battles take place, which are far exacerbated now in, um, in this environment. So I know lots of parents, I've talked to so many different parents who just feel in this corona situation, like, oh my God, I'm doing all this teaching and I'm here or I'm working from home and I'm here, but I'm not really here and I feel so guilty that I'm not spending time connecting to my kids. We're gonna figure out how to do that in a minute. 
in this, I, I want to just say that we all gravitate as in life in general, and certainly here, we gravitate toward the things that we're good at and away from the things where we're not so confident. And we also, as parents, tend to move into kind of, we either decide we're gonna parent exactly as we were parented or we're gonna the exact opposite. And there's a self-assessment that's both in the book, but also we have one, we have it online where you can actually uh, answer a series of questions and it'll give you a report on where you're spending too much time, where you're not spending enough time and where you're gravitating. And there are archetypes that have emerged and we've had several thousand people take this online. And here are the very common profiles that just come from what we grew up with or our styles as parents. So there's six. I'm going to do them real quick, give you a little overview. And you can take the self-assessment online. And actually, if you, we're going to give you a code, Bedford Playhouse. And if you take it, you'll get a report and a little uh, sort of summary of the key principles. But let's, let's look at what they are and see if you can recognize yourself, your family, or your own parents in this. So there are people who gravitate toward parents. High provide, high teach. It's what I call, let's see if this is going to work for me here, the breadwinner. That's sort of a work hard, you know, that's the old father knows best, even though a woman can do this just as well these days, you know, they go to work and then any time spent with the kids, they are teaching, but they're not really focused on the household logistics at all. They don't know how dinner got on the table and they are not really, they're not warm and fuzzy and kids don't feel particularly like they're understood, but they're taught. So high provide, high teach. The flip side is a high a range, high relate. That's very often a stay-at-home parent who's got the house operating so organized, everything flows, and they're always there with a big hug and they connect to the kids, but they don't play the disciplinarian role. And they may have given up a career uh, and professional aspirations in order to do that. There's the high provide, high range. It's what I call the responsible doer. And these are people who are get it done folks. They get their job done. They're very productive at work and at home. They keep things, they got the to-do list going, but slowing down to the speed of kids is torture. It's like too slow. I'm not getting to-dos done if I'm sitting here reading this book with you. And then there's the opposite, which is what I call the Mary Poppins. And these are people who are amazing with kids. They connect, they relate, they teach but maybe the kids are eating peanut butter and jelly six times a day, and who cares if we don't have money? In a lot of families, the relate and teach, in dual income families, a lot of times the parents are both responsible doers and the caretaker gets the Mary Poppins role. Sometimes that happens. And then the last two profiles are high range, high teach, another very common stay-at-home parent, family manager, got the house operating, got the kids learning skills and chores, but no time to just be, and again, maybe not getting to uh, invest in their career. And then there's the opposite of that, which is the what I call the best friend. And this is kind of a work hard, play hard parent. Works really hard, comes home, plays, has a great time connecting to the kids, but is not really involved in, in dinner or chores and is not going to be a disciplinarian because they don't spend enough time with the kids as is. So take a minute and maybe in the chat, you could put a little, anybody have any comments on, do you see yourself? Do you see your household? Do you see your parents? Does this explain your own childhood a little bit? Let me see if I can get to the chat box here and sort of see any comments that you guys have. Here we go, chat. Responsible doer here, <laughs> yeah. Can you see yourself? Anybody can feel free to like throw what you think you are up into the board. It's kind of interesting. And are there good combo couples? Let me answer that question. It's a really good question. So a lot of times that is what happens. You have these combo couples where, you know, you've got a responsible doer and a Mary Poppins or a breadwinner and a hearth maker, a family manager and a best friend. And you just sort of fall into those roles and you may play them well. In my experience and through lots of interviews with couples, with kids, and with experts, 
the truth is the parent, each parent actually real, like a lot of times in those things, parents kind of resent that they don't get to play the roles that they don't play. So if somebody in, is the family manager and they're home all day with the kids, for example, doing all the logistics and then they're the disciplinary and they don't get to be the good guy. And then their opposite, the best friend is working and then gets to be the good guy or the good girl. And there's a little bit of feeling cheated that you don't get to relate or you don't get to provide or you don't get to uh, teach or you don't feel confident that you're, you teach your kids anything that, and so there's, I think couples, actually individuals really want to at least touch all four. And the truth is kids want, kids don't want one parent who doesn't understand them, who only teaches them. If you go to the breadwinner, for example, though the kids get all four things, they really don't want a parent who's only working and only disciplining or only teaching, but doesn't really ever understand them. So the truth is you should be aware if you have strengths but also make sure as a couple that you cross pollinate and give everybody a chance to touch all four. Good. All righty. So the unlocks on this, if you, uh, what I have found is are on relate and arrange and self care. This is where people get stuck the most. Parents get stuck. So relate, even not in Corona times, honestly, is the hardest thing for parents to do can't relate to kids at every age and stage. And we always feel guilty that we're not spending enough time with our kids. So in the research that I did for the book, the eight years of research, I had one question, which is how much time and attention do kids need to feel loved and secure? Because isn't that like the ultimate question? If we knew how much time and attention kids needed for that, we'd know where the edge is. And that I'm an organizer, I'm not a child development expert, so I needed to go to the experts for that. And it was hard to find the answer, but I found it. And it's extremely liberating and really makes sense. So here's the answer, eight years of research. Children thrive on short bursts of like five to 15 minutes at a time of truly undivided attention delivered consistently, not big blocks of time delivered occasionally. Short bursts. Why short bursts? Most ex experts say, kids have short attention spans, right? So most experts say to calculate about a minute for each age of life. I want you to think about that for a minute. That means a one-year-old has a one minute attention span for that like true connecting before their eyes shift to the next shiny object. And a five-year-old, if you're gonna like have a deep conversation with a five-year-old, that lasts five minutes and then they're off to the next game or something. And a teenager, like 15-year-old, 15 minutes, right? So if you think about that, this is for these like, and the consistency means it's built into the fabric of the day. It's not, that you have to add this time. You just change the nature of the time you're already spending with your kids. And if you take each transition point, it's each reconnection point with your kid in the day, when they first wake up, if you go off to work, even if it's in the house, before you leave and separate, that's a transition point. When you come back into the room or you're done work, either for lunch or the end of the day, you reconnect, that's a transition point family dinner time, transition, bedtime. Those are like five very common transitions in the day. If you spend the first five minutes, one minute, 10 minutes of each reconnection point and transition point with your kids in the day, in the relate, then together but apart time is not only natural, it's healthy and they're prepared for it. And I've seen this work over and over and it's the opposite of the way we work. We are all work first, play second people. Teach when we're done, then we can have quality time. Wake up, do your chores, get ready, then we can have quality time. And the experts say, flip it. Wake up, hey, how'd you sleep? Did you have any dreams? You ready for the day? 
right? Always first moments is where it counts and make them brief and make them regular. And that becomes the foundation that satisfy kids. So that's relate. And it is as essential a nutrient to human development as food and sunshine. The science is exploding with discovery of the importance of that. And I'm sure many of you have read about social emotional development, but this is the time management angle on that, which is it's just these short pulses regularly in the fabric of the day. All right, let's keep going. So that's relate. We can talk more if you have questions about that. Um, okay. So we're going to be in this for the long haul. I was talking about sort of a hybrid situation that we have to be prepared for a flow back and forth between work at home, work at work, school at home, school at work, daycare at home, daycare out, someone there, someone not. Whatever systems you set up over the last two months, I want you to not, which was very reactive, very sudden, a lot of trial and error. I want everybody to like take a beat and now think permanent. How do I reconceptualize this home into really clear zones that designate very distinct spaces for work, whether that's a sink. That's another question I'm kind of, you could put in a little chat, like how many like, just type in, are you a stay at home parent? Do you work part time? Do you work full time? You can put that in the chat and I'll kind of keep a, a little view because I want to sort of tailor my comments to the group. Um, so whatever configuration your household has full time work or part time work two full time working parents, a full time and a part time, a full time and a stay at home, whatever that is, we have to reconceptualize our homes for the long haul, that there are dis every person who works needs their own workspace. Shared workspaces don't work, not for the long haul. And ideally with a door, ideally, you know, with good light, you want to think through what's a great permanent work from home setup where I can have files and resources and my computer and I'm not sharing anything. Maybe I'm not even sharing a printer. It's just my space. The same is true for school or daycare. Distinct, wear school in your house, reconceptualize this. You don't want every room in the house to have these multifunctions. And so figure out where school and daycare is. So the kids even know when they're at school and when they are at playtime or when they're in family time and make sure that you design and preserve certain areas of your house that are 100% pure relaxation. Never a laptop, no cell phones ideally, that no work takes place. Why is this so important? It's important for so many reasons. One, as you guys have already experienced, without distinctions in your space and distinctions in your schedule, the days work and home blur into each other and it's all one big blob. When we move physically and we have these physical triggers, oh, I'm at work. Oh, I'm at home with the family. Oh, I'm at school. Oh, I'm in after school playtime. It changes the way we, we pull on different parts of our brain. We, we, we tighten up, we focus at work or school. We relax when we're at home. You need to be able to do that in your own house. And it also enables everybody to respect what each other are up to. If you see somebody in school, you don't go and start playing with them. If they're doing school on the couch in the family room and also watch movies on the couch, how do you know what they're doing? Same thing with you. And think about these pure relaxation spots that you preserve that you can physically just go. Now, how many people have a, a comfort corner in their house? This is a great question. This is one of the things that sort of emerged throughout the last couple of months with everything happening under one roof. And I've been sort of recommending this and people have found that figured this out on their own, but do you have a spot that's a comfort corner, which is if anybody in the house is feeling overwhelmed or you're feeling overwhelmed or overloaded, everybody knows that's the spot to just, that person is in overload right now. Let's either leave them alone or let's go and just give them a hug. Or 
I have people who live alone who have created a comfort corner when they're overwhelmed by the logistics, by the, the mental strain, or even the emotional strain. It's a great thing to have in your house. Jennifer, where do you, what's, your, what's your spot? Very curious. No luxury for, okay, Patty, you said no luxury for separate spaces. So I can kind of uh, address some of that. Um, and how do you adapt to apartment living? Yeah, so sometimes you do have to have dual function spaces because your space is just not conducive to all of that separation. You don't have the luxury of it. But what do you do? Let's say the dining room table is either both school and dining or work and dining. Then what you need is to create a very modular setup where all of the supplies for school or all of the supplies for work are in bins and boxes, just no more than three that you can like pull everything off a shelf, set up school or work. And at the end of school, at the end of the workday, everything goes back, gets right back into the credenza, right back onto the bookshelf, right into the nearby closet. So you need to be able to flip the spaces quickly if it's a dual function space. It should not stay work all day and all night because it just it's like calling at you in the corners of your eye and it's hard to relax, you can't escape it. Same thing with school. So you can um, use organizers and containers and bins to, to do that. All right, are we doing on time? Good. Another thing I think the biggest unlock in the whole eight quadrant thing I've found over the years, the biggest unlock is a range. A range, as I said, is a far more complex time consuming job than anyone ever anticipated. And now during Corona, any piece of that that we were able to outsource has been taken away. And what it is, is kind of forcing mechanism to realize how unevenly the labor of logistics actually has been in your household. And maybe when everybody went off to school and work, it was annoying, mildly to moderately to extremely annoying, but you could deal with it. Now with no outsourcing, it's a tipping point for most people. But I think it's a great forcing mechanism to change the divvying up of the, of the chores. I believe family logistics belong to the family, not to one person. And we very often, and honestly women, there's so many studies that women, even with husbands who are really contributing and really stepping up and really sharing women still take the lion's share studies show of family logistics organizing it divvying it up becoming the nag and it's a breaking point for most women and and it's a source of so much strain and in corona it's gotten worse so family logistics belong to everybody this is a perfect opportunity to reset not just during corona but beyond so First of all, why do it? Why re-divvy up these chores and break whatever pattern you have established? Here's all the benefits. Kids who participate in chores, study after study, far more successful by every single measure from income to marriage happiness, to social lives, to uh, career paths. Kids who participate in chores more, more successful in adulthood. Um, Here's another interesting study. Dads who share chores actually bolster their daughter's career aspirations. And this is an amazing study done at the University of British Columbia. So seeing dad do chores actually helps women aspire to much greater careers. And finally, and this is the clincher, couples who share chores have more sex, more connected as a couple. As Many people will say the most romantic thing that you can do is share the dishes do the, and start with just doing the dishes together every day. Even in a working and stay at home parent relationship, that's fine. Start with the dishes and it's time to connect. It says we're in this together. Um, and then if you're going to divvy up the chores, I have a game that I do with uh, uh, families that's very revealing and it's called putting all your cards on the table. And you can just take a stack of three by five cards. The thing about the chores is that they're invisible. 
what it takes to run a household is invisible to everybody, including the person who takes the lion's share of the work. You just do it unconsciously. So you have to make the invisible visible and you, every card gets one of the chores, order food, unpack it, disinfect it, you know, uh, do the laundry, fold the laundry, all of the chores. And you can sit around as a family with this game and you pull up a chore and you say, who does this? And you put it in front of the person who does it. And you literally lay out the cards and you get an instant visual picture of the distribution of labor. And it is profoundly illuminating. And once that's done, you can renegotiate, renavigate as a family and re-divvy up the chores. You may even decide there's certain ones that we outsource right now. What are we going to do about it? We share those or divide those. And as soon as we can, we're going to outsource those again. So it's a great, great tool. All right. Um, so that's all the part side. I want to drill down a little bit on self and then I'm going to open it up to questions very soon. Um, so every, every time people take the self-assessment, uh, every study that we've done and survey we've done, parents tend to spend more time, devote more time in the part than the self side. We tend to sacrifice self-care to be there for our kids. But we can't, right? Because we overestimate our ability to perform well at work or with our families when we're on an empty tank. And I think that actually, let me ask this also in the chat, just a minute uh, to get a little input. What keeps you from spending enough time on self-care? What stops us from spending time on self-care when we are parents? Guilt. Yep, you feel like any time that you uh, take for yourself, you're stealing it from your job or your kids. Chores, there it is. Jennifer said nonstop chores, unequal distribution of labor, uh, which is why I talked about that first. Re divvy up that labor. You have every motivation to do it, it's going to open up so much time for self care. Um, work plus guilt, there's always something more important to do. We think that it's not the most important, right? And priorities, you always put yourself last. And we think as parents, like sacrificing ourselves is kind of the noble thing to do, but it's really not because if you can unlock that arrange and you recognize that the relating time is these shorter bursts, it actually opens up space and you are a human. And the way we operate here is one of the most important lessons we teach our kids, right? They learn from what they watch. If we are not sleeping, if we are not exercising, if we are not cultivating our adult love relationships, and if we don't have any kind of hobbies that define us at all, kids grow up watching that model, right? So you need to do it really in the interest model for your kids exercise, model for your kids adult love relationships and caretaking, um, hobbies. Let's see what Jennifer says. Everyone is so used to you to caretaking that it feels to them that I'm distancing when I take care of self. Changing this, good. All right, so now one is guilt and all the emotions and all the patterns. We've talked about that a bit. I can justify it there's another really big unlock that I realized when I was working on this book and I did this research on kids and I was like, what else gets in our way? I think it's our approach to self-care. So throughout most of your life, I mean, if you had your kids in your mid twenties to mid thirties, that means 25 to 35 years of your life, self-care looked like big blocks of time. Exercise was 90 minutes, three times a week. Love, date night was hours on end. You could spend, you know, hours over bottles of wine with friends well into the night. You could spend all day on the weekends on your hobbies. You could sleep as late as you wanted. Big blocks. Once we become parents, we don't realize we have to change. We don't get those kind of big blocks. And then we're so defeated. We're like, if I can't exercise three times a week for 90 minutes, why bother at all? 
date, love is only date night on Saturday nights. If we can't get a sitter, there's no date night. If I can't do nine hours on my hobbies, why do it at all? So here's the, here's the unlock. It's the exact same principle of how we nurture kids. Short bursts delivered regularly. With sleep is the one exception. We'll talk about that. We need our seven to nine hours a night. You need to be a ninja about that. But even if you're sleep deprived, you need to learn to rest in 20 minute doses or less. One to 20 minute doses of exercise delivered into the fabric of your day. One to 20 minute love connections with your spouse. Check in with each other three or five times a day. Just how you doing? How'd the meeting go? What'd you have for lunch? What's going on over there? And really be focused on each other, right? 20 minutes at the end of the night, not to talk logistics, but to just connect with each other. If that's all you can do and you do it and you're fully focused, it actually fuels the relationship. Fun. You don't need a five hour version of your hobby. Find it 10 to 20 minutes. If you want to learn to play the guitar, you can do that in like eight minutes a night. It's fine. And if you change the texture, you can nurture yourself with the integrating the fabric of your day just as you can with your kids. No difference. Change your approach and it will lift you, it will strengthen you, and you will constantly be fueling up even as you are taking care of everybody else. That plus sharing the workload and you guys are golden and you actually can manage the juggling act. You can manage the juggling act. These are the, the keys. I'm gonna leave you with three simple strategies, techniques or um, skills that help you move between these eight quadrants because they are very different from each other and switching gears is not easy, right? It's hard to switch from like work mode to family mode, self mode, kid mode to couple mode, couple mode to self time. How do you do it? Three, three skills. Can't be a perfectionist. But it's not just don't be a perfectionist. Be a selective perfectionism. And in the book I talk about, I have a whole chapter on how to control perfectionism by changing the way you think about it. I'm thinking of three versions of anything that you're about to do. The maximum, the minimum, and the moderate. And then pick which one is right for that day or that moment. It's not about no screen time. Every parent feels so guilty about all the screen time their kids are on. You're buying yourself peace of mind, that's fine. It's not no screen time, it's synchronized screen time as a family where everybody's on screens at the same time and everyone is off screens at the same time. And if you simply synchronize it, maybe park all the devices at the front door like a Japanese house with shoes, that's where our devices go. That opens up space for synchronized together time as well as synchronized screen time. That's it, that, that'll help. And finally, making mindful transitions. And this is something that I think pre and certainly during and post corona, if we just take a moment, it's so hard to switch gears between these eight quadrants. Um, and if you just take a pause before you cross any threshold, you're leaving your office, you're coming to the family. Before you cross the threshold, you set your intention for the other side of that door. I'm not carrying work over the threshold. I'm leaving work behind. I am going to come out for 15 minutes or one hour, whatever it is, my intention is to show my family how excited I am that they are here and they're in my house and we live together and we get to talk. And when you go into your office, same thing, leave whatever happened at the ha household hectic morning and walk into your office, set your intention to be focused. All right. That is three skills to managing the juggling act, very specific to the parenting years. And that's the model, that's your roadmap. And this roadmap will help you now. I think this has been a time and opportunity that is, that is a real forcing mechanism to recognize what our patterns have been and actually make changes. And you know, self-care is critical to you know, immunity. You have more reason than ever to, to figure out the self-care and work together as a family and a couple 
to make sure that you are do both all doing your part and fueling yourself in small bursts and you can actually make this work. All right, I wanna open up for questions. Okay, uh, Julia, I just would like to say that if anybody would just please submit uh, their questions through the Q&A so we can keep them organized, that'd be very helpful. Um, we had one before that um, when you posted the common profiles, the various profiles that you've named, is that um, is there an online survey that people can go to to sort of uh, identify themselves if they if they'd like to? Yes. So there is. I'll just put this up. So you can go to my website juliemorganstern.com and go to find the Time to Parent book page. And there's a button that says Take the Time to Parent Self Assessment. If you take that and you put in the code Bedford Playhouse. Uh, you will get a report and also will email you a single page sheet that has the quadrants on it. So you have like a one pager to put on your fridge or whatever, a little bit about the 20 minutes of uh, self care and the short bursts of attention. So you can uh, go online and take it. It'll give you the instant report and then you'll get the one page. Okay. Um, you, we have another yeah. question. Uh, from Angela, who says, please explain perfectionism aspect more, if you can. The perfectionism, yeah, so perfectionism. Perfectionism is black and white thinking, that, and it's very paralyzing. Perfectionists basically think there's only two versions of anything. It's either amazing, I did an incredible job, it was the most amazing thing, or it was a disaster, and I can never show my face on this town again, or to this family, and I'm ashamed of what I just did. And that's very paralyzing on one hand, and it's also extremely time consuming. And if you're a perfectionist about everything, even with eight, moving between eight things, you're not gonna, you're gonna get stuck in a quadrant because it's until it's perfect, you can't leave. So you need to loosen that up. Max Mod Min changes black and white thinking to shades of gray. So before you do any task mindlessly, especially anything you think could really gobble up a lot of time, write down on a piece of paper, what's the maximum I could do right now? What's the minimum and what's the moderate? I will give you the perfect classic example. It's your kid's birthday. And this is sort of not Corona exactly, but you'll all relate to this. It's your kid's birthday and you need to make a cake for them. You can make a handmade cake in the shape of their favorite cartoon character. It's three-dimensional beautiful, it's gonna take you hours to figure it out and do. You could get a sheet cake and put some candles in it, or you could get a, that's minimum, maximum, minimum, or moderate would be you get a cake mix and you add some chocolate chips and you bake, but you got that assist. What's the max, the min, and the mod? And depending on the day, depending on what else is going around, you can choose the level that's appropriate for that moment. In the time of Corona, that has to apply to schoolwork, has to apply to the cleaning standards, has to apply to everything. Max Mod Min. It's very liberating. All right, uh, another question from Lisa. Uh, can you offer tips for increasing relate time with a teenager who wants to be alone in her room for much of the day and night? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm going to give you... Um, an example straight from a client. I have a couple that I've been coaching for many, many years, professional working parents who were very, you know, they had family dinner and they family game time. They were great until their daughter turned 13. And when their daughter turned 13, she was like, did not want to, she was having a lot of trouble. Also a lot of anxiety, a lot of social trouble, a lot of school issues. She was always kind of stressed out which is very common for adolescents these days. And her mom said, she's so difficult and she doesn't want to spend any time with us anymore. And I think I should quit my job because I need to be there for her. And I said, before you quit your job, let's look at the quadrants. And I showed her the quadrants and she was like, ah. Oh. She said, you know, we, feel so bad about how much she's struggling that every minute we spend with her, we're trying to coach her. We're trying to help her. We're trying to teach her and let her know, listen, this time will pass. Don't take this. 
don't worry about who's getting more likes on social media. And they were always teaching. And they um, decided, she and her husband, to stop and that they would spend 70% of their time with their daughter only relating, not trying to guide, teach, coach, coddle, anything. And if she, her daughter had a meltdown, it would just like, I so get so frustrated when that happens too. And just relate with no pressure. And that really helped a lot. Um, and the second thing is sometimes you just have to go into their world and not try to get them into yours. So if she likes to do video games, then maybe you go and you just enter her world of video games and play with her, but ask, like, find out what delights her, what frustrates her, what interests her, what is it about this? That's what entering your child's world is. Don't look for your own enjoyment of the task or activity they're doing. Go in and look at the activity through your kid's eyes and learn to notice without judgment what interests them, excites them, baffles them, challenges them. And that's relating. Make sure you're just trying to be looking at it through her eyes and not for your own enjoyment. Okay, next question. Right. Next question from Allison. What about college students who have their courses to do and are also so disappointed about not being able to be at school? Man, that is so, so, so tough. Um, I think it's so many different things going on there. And college students, I mean, it's really difficult and sad. Um, I would absolutely look, when we go to college, we also are trying to learn how to manage our time. I would really try to help them contain the school time, add the structure, add the spaces, add a schedule, um, and help them build in constructive time for decompression. And, you know, we're getting to the point where maybe they can have a relatively socially distant walk with a friend who's six or 10 feet away. Um, and just try the three dimensions of any human contact feel very different and uh, fuel our souls in a way that doing everything through a screen does not. So it's tough and counseling. I mean, I would take advantage of any kind of counseling that the school is offering uh, or mental health stuff that the, the state is offering to just give kids an outlet because they're dealing with a lot. Uh, what do you suggest uh, families and dual working parents do when the shades of gray are not matched by the employer during these tough work from home times? Yeah, I mean, I've been doing a ton of uh, work from home, manage a remote team, seminars through this whole period uh, for companies. And this is a gigantic issue if companies are just like transferred the way we worked before to now. And people are often working even longer hours, right? From the time you wake up till the time you go to sleep, you feel you have to always be on. I have a conversation, a one-on-one -on -one conversation and talk to your boss, talk to your teammates and try to synchronize. One of the best things that you can do is if it's not already happening with remote teams, everybody, nobody knows what's going on with the other one. Managers are really worried, but have a conversation and maybe you have one or two daily huddles a day, which is like you set the deliverables for the day in the morning, you talk to your boss, you talk to your team, and then there's an end of day huddle. And as long as the work is done, how you got it done, when you got it done is less important. Uh, but I think it's time to start having these conversations. Companies just don't, they're not even being, they were caught as off guard as everybody else was. Some of them are really, most are having trouble turning the ocean liner into, we can't have people working 14 hours a day from home. So, um, or contact us and we'll talk to them about doing a webinar. <laughs> We've been doing a lot for a very like, high intense companies, you know, a lot of fin financial firms and that are just nonstop. And that doesn't translate when you're working from home. All right, uh, Julie, this is, uh, yeah, this is our last one. Um, can parents use their understanding of this framework to reevaluate their relationship with their own parents? A hundred percent, a hundred percent can do that. And I will tell you a really interesting story um, I had, I did a workshop, a seminar, time to parent seminar, um, 
uh, with a group and there was a woman who saw this and said, oh my God, is it too late? Like I have been a high provide, high arrange, not really relating. I now have a 15 year old doesn't want to spend any time with me. I wish I had known this earlier. Is it too late? And I said, well, I don't know what your relationship is with your parents. And she said, oh, well, my dad was the best friend. <laughs> my mom was the arranged uh, teach. And every time, this is a 38-year-old woman, every time I call my parents, my mom picks up the phone. I tighten up because she's like, how's this going? How's your weight? How's the house? Are you doing this? She's like right away starts, you know, asking her daughter a million questions. And then when her mom passes the phone to her dad and her dad goes, Hey honey, how you doing? She said, I just start crying. Cause like I could just release. He so gets me. I can be myself. And I said, if tomorrow you called your house, your parents' house and your mom picked up and she said, Hey honey, how are you? How would you react? And she said, it's all I want. I said, if it's not too late for you at 38, it is not too late for you with your son at 15. We are, our parent child relationship is for our lifetime. And it is never too late to hit reset. And that you can start even without explanation tomorrow. Change it up, start by relating divvy up the housework, have a, a family meeting and say, we fell into this pattern, I help contribute, but it doesn't work, let's redo it. it. Every day is a fresh day. And I think it can help you also fill in if your parents aren't around anymore for those gaps and fill in those gaps for yourself. And maybe you have to relate to you if you didn't get related to as a kid. A very powerful framework, it's all just being a human. And I think we can use it in every single direction. All right, Julie, thank you very much. This was really great. Um, for everybody who's uh, tuned in, Julie's book is available um, from multiple outlets if you're interested in picking it up. Um, we will also uh, be sending around this information that's on the screen right now uh, if you registered and are attending so that you have it uh, as a resource. Um, Julie, thank you again. This is, uh, thank you everybody for asking the questions. We really appreciate it, and uh, we hope uh, you'll you'll come back at some point and do this again. Yeah, Dan, thank you so much. It was great for everybody to come. Do stay in touch. You can come and I also do an Instagram live every day at six o'clock, sort of end of day wrap up. That's free. People can come to that um, and great. sign up for a newsletter. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Stay well, Happy everybody. Trails. Yeah. Easy.